Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, Layla, it's an honor to meet you. Um, and about a couple seconds before we walked out, Layla told me that she wanted me to read a passage, any passage that I chose from the book. So yeah, it was a, you know, no pressure, but um, I actually, I did have one that I, you know, I had a bunch of questions uh, from reading, so I thought it would be a perfect place to start. Um, they staggered up the stairs. With each step, the magic faded, her drunken joy giving way to nausea. He started to strip. She felt her heart shrink. Faced with the banality of a zipper, the prosaic vulgarity of a pair of socks, the clumsiness of a drunk young man. She wished she could have said, stop, not another word, I don't want this anymore, but she felt cornered. Lying beneath his hairless torso, all she could do was try to make it go quickly, simulating pleasure, overdoing the orgasmic moans so he would finish up, shut up, get it over with. Did he even notice that she had her eyes closed? She shut them in a rage, as if seeing him disgusted her, as if she was already thinking about the next men, the real men, the good ones, somewhere else, the ones who would finally know how to control her body. She quietly opens the door of the apartment. In the building's inner courtyard, she lights a cigarette, three drags, and then she calls her husband. I'm not waking you, am I? She tells him she spent the night at her friend Lauren's house, a few blocks from the newspaper office. She asks about her son. Yeah, it was a good night, she says. Staring at the spotted mirror in the building's lobby, she smooths the lines around her eyes and watches herself lie. In the empty street, she hears her own footsteps. A man shoves past her as he runs to catch a slowing bus, and she lets out a cry of alarm. To kill time, she decides to walk home. She wants to be sure that she'll return to an empty apartment where no one will question her. She listens to music and vanishes into the frozen city. Richard has cleared away the breakfast things. The dirty cups are piled in the sink. There's a slice of toast stuck to one of the plates. Without taking off her coat, Adele sits down on the leather sofa. She presses her handbag to her body. She doesn't move. The day will not start until she's taken her shower, until she's washed the stale tobacco smell off her blouse, until she's hidden the bags under her eyes with concealer. For now, she remains in her filth, suspended between two worlds, the mistress of the present tense. The danger is over. There is nothing more to fear. So that passage comes relatively early on in uh, Layla's beautiful book, Adele, which was just published here. Um, it's, it's the story of a, of a woman who's addicted to sex, to, to cheating on her husband. Um, and, you know, I, I guess this is sort of a good place to start with, you know, what you've, you've said in interviews that you are, are inspired to write by your deepest fears. What is the fear that inspired this book, th this character? Probably the fear of losing control, the fear of being so bored that I would do very bad things. Um, yeah, the fear of boredom, I think, probably. And um, it's very interesting that you chose this, uh, this passage because I think that it's very interesting to understand Adele through this very typical scene because she's bored by the man she she meets even if she wants to have sex with him and she's so disappointed by sex she's a sex addict but she hates having sex because she's always disappointed and it's weird and funny because i um, had a lot of conversation with my uh, girlfriends and they very often told me that they were disappointed by sex, but that the fact that the discovery of sex was not as wonderful, as glamorous, as extraordinary as what everyone had uh, said to them. You know, when you are a teenage girl and you watch movies and you think that uh, sex is going to be so beautiful and the man is going to be tender and uh, uh, everyone is writing in female magazine about orgasm, but it's not the real it's not the, the reality. The reality of, of sex is much more trivial, much more prosaic. And I think that for some women or some person, it can be very violent to discover that. Do you think that the boredom is the result? I mean, in this book, she's, she's married, she has a career, she has a child. All of these things seem to bore her. Even sex bores her. What, you know, what, what would be sort of some, the alternative to a non-boring life in, in her mind? It's, it's hard to imagine. You know, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I, I really don't know what can help Adele. I'm not here to put my characters on the analyst's couch. I'd, 
I, and actually, I don't really care about her psychology. That's not my problem. I'm a writer. My problem is to try to uh, describe her emotions and maybe to help the reader feel some empathy with her. But um, I, I think that I hate um, psychological novels. And uh, I think like Kundera, that as you can never know someone, how could you know a character? You, you, it's impossible to know a human being. I think that what you know about someone is just a surface. You know a few things. And, but and you can even live with someone for 20 years, 25 years. You will never know him or her. So I don't think that I can know a character, and I don't think that I can know someone. So it's hard, uh, as American audiences, we see this book. This just came out as the follow-up to The Perfect Nanny. Uh, but actually, you wrote this one first. Uh, and it was published earlier than the, right, just before The Perfect Nanny in, in France. And um, so I'm just going to sort of get the chronology backwards. But, but if, if this one influenced The Perfect Nanny, which is also about um, a woman two women, really, who are um, exploring their womanhood and their, and their relationship to motherhood. I think the threads of commonality are so distinct between these two novels. Just as a reader, I don't want to put that, you know, those words in your mouth, but if there are commonalities, do you think that, that Adele is more like the nanny who, you know, murders one of the children in her care? Uh, that's not a spoiler. It's the first sentence of the perfect nanny. Um, or, or do you think that she has more in common with the mother, with Miriam, who sort of has a very complex relationship with her own child who she, you know, leaves in the care of a, of a caretaker while she decides to go back to work? Mm, I don't really know. She probably has in common with the, both of them. With um, Louise, she has in common the loneliness. There are two very, very lonely women, and they can't speak. They can't speak out. They are mute. If you read Adele and if you read The Perfect Nanny, you will see that they don't speak much, maybe two or three sentences in the whole book. And they, are, they, they, can't, say, they can't ask for help. And they can't speak out saying, I have a problem, please help me, I'm suffering. And uh, I think that if they commit what they commit, Louise, she murders children and Adele, she cheats on her husband and she's very violent. It's probably because they have the, this inability to speak out and this inability to express themselves. But she also have in common with Miriam, as you said, the fact that she finds uh, motherhood tedious and that she finds the family life very boring. And that um, she discovers also the fact that a bourgeois family life is not synonymous with uh, happiness and with comfort and with softness. That the domestic life and the domestic place actually is probably a political place, a place of domination, a place of violence, a place where you try to, um, wh where you have to fight uh, with your husband, with uh, your, ch well, your children, with your domestics. So um, yeah, I think that she has in common with the, the two characters. You've written both of these novels as a mother yourself of two. How, it, do you find it um, motivating or... or you know, to be a mother, you no, mean? No, <laughs> difficult to write write these really often, you know, painful and horrific depictions of a mother's relationship with her children uh, as as a mother yourself. No, you know that's like a sort of a, a revenge and um, <laughs> a way to ex to express myself and try not to yell at my ch at my children but at my readers. So I. Yes, I, I take all my anxiety, my nightmares, and I give them to you, so my children are safe with me. <laughs> and um, no, but you know, I found it very difficult to to become a mother, and especially as a writer. I was uh, in a conference like two two weeks ago in Sciences Po in Paris, and it was a creative writing conference. And um, a young uh, student asked me about how I was writing and my methodology and everything. And I said to her, OK, I'm going to tell you something that maybe will surprise you, but you are a woman, and it's going to be even more difficult for you to write. And that's, that's still true. Because when you are a mother and you are at, at home and you're saying to your friends and to people, you know, um, I'm taking a nanny to take care of my child in the home, but I'm writing in my office, the door closed. And people are saying, 
and you don't take care of your child. He's at home and you take a nanny to take care of him to write. Because if you say, I go to the factory or I work or I'm going to earn money, that's okay. But if it is to write, people look at you as like you're a bad mother because your real duty is to be with your child. And even worse, they think that you should want to be with your child, that there's something wrong with you if you don't want to. And there's a, a text of uh, Virginia Woolf, a text that I love, called the, the Angel of the House. And she says that every woman has this fantasy of the angel of the house, this perfect woman who always sacrifices herself, who is so nice to her husband and to her children, who always think of them first before thinking of, of her. And one day she said she killed the angel of the house and she killed her very violently. And that's what I did too. I, I took a gun and I killed her because I had to kill her. If you don't kill her, you can't live and you can't write. So, yes, it, I, I needed to express that as a woman and as a writer to express how it can be difficult to be a mother and how it can be sometimes a burden, if, even if it's a taboo to say that. But I think that when you become a mother, yes, something there is something new in your life, something wonderful, but there is also something that dies. You're in grief when, you're a mother, when you become a mother. And um, that's at the same time wonderful and sometimes very di difficult. Do you think that's true just of motherhood inherently? or Because so much of, of your work is very socially minded. It's, it's all about sort of the culture of motherhood and the culture that creates something mysterious called being a bad mom and you know, defines what that means for you. Um, is, do you think that there is something sort of cult, there, there, is this an indictment of sort of the culture of motherhood, the cult that says, you know, you have to behave a certain way or you're, you don't love your kids enough? No, I think that what is difficult for women and for mothers is that we always feel guilty. My, my books are a lot about guilt. Um, the difference, I think, be, between being a father and being a mother is that when you are a mother, you immediately know what it is to feel guilty because everyone is going to make you feel guilty. Even people who think that they are feminists. You know, my mother, she's a very feminist woman. But when I leave home, like here, I'm in, I'm in New York, my mother, she will ask me, but where are your children? I say, they are with my husband. They are alone. And I'm like, no, they are with my husband. But for my mother, uh, a husband, uh, a man, a father is nothing. Your mother has to be with her children. Even if, as I said, my mother is a, is a feminist. When I leave, people say to me, oh, you, leave, you left your children, they must miss you so much. But when my husband leaves, they say, oh, you must miss your children so much. You, try, you work too hard. So that's very different. We have to deal with guilt all the time. And, um, you know, now I think that um, maybe being a free woman is accepting the idea of disappointing people. And now I accept the idea of disappointing my children, disappointing my husband, disappointing my mother, because they all are expecting so much from me. And sometimes I just don't want to give them what they expect because I have something else to do. And the day you accept to disappoint people, as a woman, I think that you become a free woman. It's interesting that you brought up Virginia Woolf. I think, you know, even though this, the surfaces of her novels are so placid and serene and yours can be very violent and um, there's so much action, I still, it r reminds me so much of her work and that there's just this, you know, this woman sort of silent in a corner, endlessly frustrated with the, the boredom of, of her circumstance, but, you know, it's, it's a century ago. So w do you think that the things just haven't changed for writers and for for mothers in general. Yes, it has changed, but uh, we should uh, still be, be very, we, we still have to fight for a lot of things. And I think that it's not a fight against others. It's a fight against ourselves. We have to figure it out what kind of women do we want to be. Because sometimes we are our worst enemies, because at the same time we want to be very free, etc. And we want to be perfect women, perfect nannies, perfect mothers. And this ideal of perfection is um, maybe very dangerous for feminism. I think that feminism should also be the idea that we don't have to be perfect and that it's okay not to be perfect and that maybe it's impossible to be perfect. 
How do you feel, by the way, about the, the title change to Perfect Nanny and also to Adele from, I think the actual translation of the French title is The Ogre in the Garden, um, but, but the American publisher, it was changed to Adele and, and similarly Lullaby, I think it was in French, um, was changed to The Perfect Nanny. How do you feel about that sort of? You know, my, my book was translated in like 42 languages and each publisher knows his market, knows his public and he's the, the, the best person to say what kind of title and what title we should uh, choose. So my philosophy is to trust my, my publishers because I think that they are always right. And of course he's here, so <laughs> I will tell you let, later <laughs> what I think about it. Um, so obviously motherhood is it underpins all, all of your stories, but I also think there's a, there are really distinct threads of um, race and class relations that, that you can't ignore in either book. Um, in The Perfect Nanny, you know, she is a, she is a French Moroccan mother, right, Miriam, but she deliberately, I remember, does not want to hire a nanny of Moroccan descent because she will only trust her children with a white woman. Um, in, in this novel, you know, the, the, the white characters are sort of just irre irredeemably uh, nasty. Um, whether there's a, there's a young uh, white boy who messes with this, the woman's son in the playground and the mother slaps her son and just sort of, you know, walks away and thinks that that's sort of, uh, that's acceptable. Um, you know, I, I think, is, is there, is there, what informs your sort of portrayal of the race relations as it has as it has to do with parenting? You know, I think that uh, in France we have a very different uh, way of looking at what you call race. Um, because even this word for me is very weird because I don't believe in race. I believe in racism, but racism was built because we believed in race. It's, uh, but I don't really think that it exists. And maybe we stopped uh, thinking that races exist, we would fight in a better way to, for against racism, but that's not the question. Uh, actually, I like to, to play with this idea of identity and this idea of race, because I think that literature is maybe the best um, way and the best place to show that identity and race will never define us, and that... Um, Sometimes you describe a character and the qualities of a character. You don't say what is the color of, of his skin. And uh, the reader will think, oh, okay, he's probably white because of this or that. And then he discovers he's not. He's from Maghreb or he's, he's black. And I like the, the surprising my, my readers and playing with their own prejudice and trying to show them that identity tells nothing about a character. I don't think that you can define a character by his ethnicity. A character is made of what he does. And every human being, I think, identity is what you do, what you fight for, is your values. It's not the color of your skin or what's it's written on your passport. What about class? I mean, there's such a distinct sense of, you know, the difference between Miriam and Louise being, you know, one woman works for the other woman and um, one woman has the luxury to not spend the time with her children. Uh, same with Adele. She is able to not go to work most of the time because she's having these affairs because she can. She doesn't have to have a job. Her husband is this, you know, esteemed doctor. So w what does that say about boredom? Is it is it the sort of an ennui of a certain class that only a certain class can afford? No, I don't think so. But what I wanted to, to show in the two books is um, the fact that today in a city like Paris, everyone acts as if classes doesn't, don't exist, as if we were all the same, we are all equal, we don't belong to the same humanity, and it's so nice, there is no racism, and there is no fight between classes, and we are all belong to the same world, and what interests me is this hypocrisy, more than the classes themselves, the fact that we act as if we were living together, you know, now the the hipster um, uh, neighborhood in Paris, like in the 10th arrondissement, like in, in the Perfect Nanny, are supposed to be very mixed neighborhoods because it used to be popular neighborhoods, but it's not, actually, it's very bourgeois. But people, they wear very old clothes, but very expensive. <laughs> they go to eat natural and rustic food, but very expensive. So it's like... a 
theater. You yeah. you act as if you were from ro working class and you were from a yeah, popular neighborhood, but actually you're just a bourgeois. So that's what interests me. The fact that it's like um, you deny the, the fight of classes because you don't want to look at it. You don't want to, to look at misery. You don't want to look at poverty. You want to think that everything is going to be okay. Politically, you, you know, you've been selected by uh, President Macron to sort of be kind of, I, I don't remember what it's exactly called, but you're basically an ambassador of French literature and culture to the rest of the world. What, d first of all, what does that responsibility entail? And also, do you find that it influences or at all impacts the work that you're creating as this figure for the country? Uh, so what it implies, um, I'm an ambassador, I represent France inside the international organization of Francophonie. It's an organization with 84 countries, Francophone countries, French-speaking countries. So um, my work is mostly about negotiating for cultural program, educational program in Africa, in France, in, in Maghreb. Um, it has nothing to do with my work as a writer. It's two different worlds, two different persons, two different things. But it's very important for me because, you know, I come from Morocco and Morocco is a plurilingual uh, country. Even if now some of the most conservative part of Morocco would say, no, we have one language and it's Arabic. I was uh, told by my parents that we were plurilingual. We, we used to speak Arabic, barbarian, French, Spanish, Hassani, a lot of languages. And I think that it's a chance. It's a very, it's a wonderful chance for Morocco, but also for Tunisia, for Algeria, and for a lot of African countries to speak a lot of languages. You know, when you are born in France, very often as a child you speak just one language, you speak French. When you are a young Moroccan, very often you speak French and Spanish and, and Arabic without even thinking about it because it's natural. So I think we should keep that and we should fight for that. And um, even if, of course, we speak French because of colonization, but now we won the war and we took French and French is ours. And I don't think that French language belongs to France. It belongs to everyone who speaks French. Do you have a next frontier in mind in terms of the next novel that you want to write? Yes, I have, but I won't tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me later. No, you know, you, you can't speak about um, uh, a book you're writing. It's exactly like speaking about a, a lover you're having in secret. You will lose interest in the lover if you speak about him. So you have to keep it in secret life. I don't know if we want to open it up to questions or... Um, your story in The New Yorker, The Confession, and I was intrigued to hear it as from a male perspective um, because your, your work that I've read previously is so much from a female perspective. And I wondered, I suppose, two things, how that was for you, writing from the male perspective, and whether you see yourself doing more. Uh, you know, I have a friend in Morocco who just after the, the Tunisian revolu uh, revolution, she decided to collect testimonies from women uh, and she asked them about their intimacy and a lot of things. And it worked very well. It was a huge success in, in Morocco. And one day she got a call from a man who said, I would like to tell you my story. She said, um, yeah, but you know, it's only story of women. What do you want to, to tell me? And he said, I want to tell you about a rape. I committed a rape uh, many years ago, and I want to confess. And um, she talked to the man, and two or three days after we met, and she said, oh, I had a very strange conversation with a man, and he told me he committed a rape. And I thought about, it, about him and about this man for many, many months, many years. And I was always asking myself, that's weird, because I have a lot of friends or girlfriends who told me they were raped. So it means that I know men who raped. 
I, uh, maybe a man who is very nice, a friend of mine, uh, a relative, someone who who is a rapist. It's imp you know I, I hate the idea that we always describe rapists as a, a psychopaths or marginalized men because most of the rapists are your friend, your husband, your father, your uncle, and a, a very good friend of the, the family. So I wanted to write this story in a male perspective, but most important in a very ordinary male perspective. A man like anyone is not a good man, but he's not a bad man. He's just mediocre. He's um, very ordinary. So that was, that's what was um, interesting for me and it was also a way to um have um, to think about rape in a different way because i think that it's a shame and it's weird that we never hear all those men who raped because i think that they are here very next to us and i would like to hear them confess Actually, Adele's husband does, the, the perspective shifts at, at a certain point, so a little more than halfway through the novel, and your question reminded me that, you know, I was, I was really curious about that decision, because most of the book is narrated from, from her point of view. Why the decision to switch to his once he finds out about her? It wasn't really a decision of mine, it happened. It's just that Richard became more and more important, and I enjoyed writing about him, and I wanted to know him. You know, very often I'm surprised by, by what I'm writing. I don't control everything, and I think that it's a mistake to think that a writer is someone who controls everything. Some of them are like that, but I think that the majority are not. It's the, Marguerite Duras used to say that it's the writing that writes, and that's true. It's not you who really writes. The more you write and something happens. And Richard happened. Any other questions? Thanks for being here, first of all. Um, I'd love to ask you a process question if you're willing to answer it. I'm just curious how you revise your work or just if you'd be willing to talk about like your process as you complete these amazing. Um, I don't really have a process, you know. As I, sa as I was saying before, I'm mostly trying to steal time from my children, from journalists, from uh, the supermarket and the grocery store where I have to go to feed my children and uh, all those things. And I try to steal time to, to write. So I don't really have a, a real process. And I hope when I, when, I grew, uh, when, I grew, when I will grow old that I will have a process when I, I don't. I write when I can. And um, I try to find this wonderful, exquisite moment that you have when you are a writer, that you have sometimes when you have a writer, this complete and total concentration, when you are completely focused in your work, so much focused that you are not here anymore, you're in another dimension, and that's what I like. And that's not that easy to, to achieve, but sometimes it happened. It happened this morning, so that's why I'm in a very good mood today. Uh, and uh, yeah, it can be extraordinary, but uh, I must say that most of the time it's very difficult and uh, it's a fight. It's a fight to to sit on your chair and say, okay, today again I'm going to write. It's a fight to begin. It's a fight to read and reread and reread the same sentence a hundred times. And it's, it's a fight because you never learn how to write. So it's it's a uh, sometimes you feel so exhausted. You like you just finished a book. You're like okay, now I know how to write. I'm going to open my computer and it's going to be easy. And it's never easy because you have to redo it from the beginning. It's like this um, myth of Sisyphe. You know this myth of this man who has to to climb with a rock in the, on the top of the mountain and then the rock goes down and he has to redo it again and again. So. It takes a lot of humility <laughs> to be a, a writer and very often people ask me, so now that you had the Goncourt Prize, do you feel more pressure for the next book? And you know, I, I used to say, 
sometimes I open my computer and I say to my computer, look at me, I have the Goncourt Prize, so you have to be nice, so now you will write this book, and it never worked. So don't care about the prize or anything, you can be whoever you want, the computer will never <laughs> do anything, and you just have to write, to write, and that's difficult. Any other questions? Um, so uh, I was wondering, do you have any writers that you particularly admire, um, either for their style or for the content of the works that they produce? A lot, a lot. Um, I admire Philip Roth a lot. Um, I wish I was Philip Roth. Uh, some of his books are masterpiece, I consider them as masterpiece. I love, um, in the US, I love the writers from the South. I love Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, and Faulkner, of course. Um, each time I read Faulkner, I want to write. I just want to go, to go back home and write and write and write, because he makes you want to be a writer and to have this very uh, sensitive and sensual feeling with language. I, I love that. Um, in France, I love uh, Albert Camus. He was very important for me to try to find this. He's very pure. I love the, his style and uh, the fact that it's very clear, very pure, very cl clinical sometimes. Um, what can I tell you? Virginia Woolf is very, was very important for me, but I think that Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and uh, Maupassant and Flaubert are probably the most important writers for me. I was rereading some books of uh, Flaubert lately, and each time I, I read a novel for, of, of Flaubert or of, of Maupassant, I'm like, okay, pff, impossible. I, I will never be the writer I want to be. So I'm a little bit depressed after reading a novel of, of Maupassant, and then I write, I rewrite again, and I try to, to do uh, the best I can. Any other questions? How involved or uninvolved are you in the process of translating your books? Um, I'm not that involved. Uh, Sam Taylor, the translator in English, but first of all, I have to know the, the foreign language to be involved because it's very difficult for me to say to my Chinese translator or Japanese translator what he has to do. Sometimes it can be very funny because my translator in Czech Republic, he sent me an email about Adele and uh, it was an email about a window. He wanted to know how the window of uh, Adele's house looked. And he sent me like 14 pictures of windows <laughs> and saying, we have 14 different words for windows. And I was like, it, there's something very weird with Czech Republic about windows, I can tell you. So, and for Adele, it was very funny with Sam Taylor, the translator, because I don't know him, but we, we share a lot through the phone or emails. And one day he, he sent me an email and he said, you know, in English, we can't use the word sex to uh, qualify genitals part. In, in French, you can say le sex de l'homme, le sex de la femme. S but in, in English, you have to be more specific. So he said, okay, can you tell me, should I put dick or penis here and here, <laughs> vagina or vulva? And I was like, oh, it's going to be a long night. So I spent... <laughs> a whole night saying, okay, on this page, vagina, vulva, da, da, dick. And so I was a little bit shocked by my own work, saying, oh, there's a lot of vagina and, <laughs> and penis in this book. <laughs> so that's how I, I share with my translator. Any other questions? I see a lot of hands moving to hair, but they're not <laughs> hands for questions. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my book club's book is Perfect Nanny this month. I'm very excited. Um, the question is, with Adele, you really capture this like thirst for the first time that's like a myth, right, in sex. And I'm wondering, I'm really curious about the addiction part. I'm just curious about like the cultural attitude towards addiction and if you spoke to addicts, whether like, 
sex addicts, love addicts, drug addicts, alcoholics to like build out that person. Cause it was, she's a total addict and it was great. Yeah, I had a lot of discussion with people of my family and uh, <laughs> they are all addicts. So it, it helped me a lot. No, but uh, you know, addiction is something that has always fascinated me. And I think that for a writer, it's something extraordinary to describe. I don't know if you have read The Gambler by Dostoevsky. It's a wonderful book about addiction. And yes, I spoke with a lot of addicts and sex addicts, mostly men, because it was very difficult for me to find the women who wanted to speak with me. And I interviewed a psychiatrist and I asked him, but how would you define addiction? And he's, he said to me, it's when you lose the freedom to say no. And I love this sentence. And I think that's exactly that. When you lose the freedom to say no. And Adele, that's exactly what she lost. And she's, she's saying yes, even to things that she knows won't be good for her and will hurt her and will disappoint her. But she says yes, because she lost this ability to say no. And when you can't say no, you can't build you can build anything. You're, you're, you're lost when you say yes to anything or anyone. And um, I don't want to judge her for being an addict. And in the book, I try never to judge her. And I don't uh, think that it's a moral issue. That's not my problem as a, as a writer. I just try to... What I wanted maybe was to save her. Because I think that this kind of woman in real life, you would judge her. Everyone would say, she's a slut, she's lost, look at her, oh, what a mess, that's humiliating, what a, why, why is she doing that, oh, she's doing that to her husband. No one would understand her because we are too afraid of this kind of person, of this kind of woman. We don't want to see the darkness inside her because maybe we are too afraid that it's going to wake up something inside of uh, of us. And... Um, I was always surprised because in Great Britain or even here in in the in America people are always asking me why why is she acting like that and actually I don't know and I don't know why people act like they act but I think that people maybe are even more shocked because she's a woman and people don't like a woman who is acting in a way that you can't explain. If she's having a lot of sex, she is a slut. She's having sex to have money or she's having sex to have pleasure. But it, it's impossible that she's just having sex because it's ir irrational. You have to tell me why. Because if I don't know why, I can't control her. I can't put her in a box. And what I want is to put her in a box. And as a writer, what I want is to help people going out of the boxes, every boxes, boxes, bo the box of motherhood, the box of class, the box of addiction. And as a writer, that's why I say I try to save my character. I try to help people going out of the box. We have time for maybe one last question, if anyone has one. Well, if there are no last questions, um, Thank you both so much for being here with us. Thank you, Lila, Thank you. for gracing us with the, uh, these Thank books and much. with your presence here tonight. Uh, please give them one last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.